listen to past episodes anytime on any device. Search the archives of over 180 episodes. Membership costs $9.95 a month, 33 cents a day. Support the broadcast that provides you with the most interesting conversation available. Talk radio at the cutting edge of science and thought. The other side is midnight.com. Welcome back, everyone, to this Saturday night, April 17th, 2021. My guests this morning, too numerous to mention so ultimately, you know their names by now, you know their bios, they're on the uh, guest page at the bottom. So go there if you're missing who's talking about what. I want to talk to Bob Harrison, because Bob, um, you sent me something very interesting earlier in the week that I wanted to pick up on. If you go back to the other side of midnight, Click on item number eight. Fast links under the um, banner on the guest page. That will take you to my items. Number eight is a video that was posted on Reddit. Uh, amateur out there, another obsessed with compulsive, put together a very good uh, summation of all the frames that NASA had released of what's called the Lander Vision System. This was the automated computer controlled camera that was able to match the map of the terrain with the actual location of the spacecraft and guide them down to within 15 feet of exactly where they wanted to land. Pretty good. And on the way down, all these frames were accumulated in the computer. Uh, it was a separate computer from the other computers that were running the Perseverance mission. And when they sat on the surface for several days, they were able to uplink through this little so to straw, the bandwidth limitation, um, many, many, many of those frames which this enterprising uh, Reddit uh, participant in the Perseverance discussion put together as a video, as a movie, and he added the Bernard Herman soundtrack from Psycho, which is kind of a weird choice. But anyway, if you click on item number eight, you will see this video of the descent and landing of Perseverance on the surface of Mars on February 18th, late in the afternoon, between about 3.30 and 4 o'clock local time. Why is the time important? Because the sun is gradually setting in the west as Mars rotates in the same direction as the Earth does, has about the same tilt, 25 degrees, so 3-something in the afternoon is equivalent to 3-something in the afternoon here on Earth. In the northern hemisphere. Item number 9 is uh, a frame from the color camera, I keep calling it the GoPro. It's not, it's another uh, company, but it's generically, you know, GoPro is like Linux. It's, you know, action, sports cameras that are reliable, rugged, available, pretty cheap. NASA took some of those, refurbished them for space, mounted them looking up and looking down, and we got all kinds of amazing video of parachute deployment, we had color view looking down of the spacecraft descending on the parachute, the heat shield falling away. Anyway, item number nine is one of those frames. And if you compare the, the surface in item number eight, the video, black and white, with item number nine, which is a color frame, you'll see this bizarre glint, this glow, this brightness of the surface that's very anomalous and as the spacecraft is descending and is moving relative to the surface, this glint, this glare, this glow, this technically it's a backscatter of solar illumination because the sun is behind the spacecraft. It's setting over in the west and you're looking east. So this is backscatter from something on or just above the surface. And Bob brought to my attention earlier this week that there is a group now that have kindly glommed onto this. They they realize looking at it that it's it's kind of weird, it's different, it's 
not been seen before, or at least it hadn't been seen until someone went looking. Bob, why don't you tell us the background story and what they are saying this is? Good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, well, basically, I, I was doing an image search for, uh, for Jezero Crater images uh, on Google and one of the images led me to a, a discussion thread where somebody was asking uh, why this glint um, asking pretty provo provocatively and uh, was getting <laughs> some nasty replies from other people but in the end uh, no, wait, 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 wait. Why would, why would an honest engineering question, we're landing on Mars, it's an alien planet, we're seeing something we haven't seen before, what is it, why would it provoke a negative response? To me, science is about asking questions, particularly when you see a phenomenon you've never seen before. Why were they hostile to the question? Well, it was pretty weird. Uh, it was being accused of uh, bringing conspiracy theory into a, oh uh, my. a scientific discussion. You're kidding! <laughs> well, wait, wait, what, did, what, 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 what did that tell your political bump? Well, it, uh, it suggested perhaps that uh, what, what's been on the last few shows is uh, getting out and about. And someone is out there to stamp out burning ducks, so no one yeah. asks this question. And you accuse them of being, oh, a conspiracy theorist. In other words, it's censorship. They're trying to to cow the questioner into thinking there was something wrong with a really brilliant question because it opens up the Pandora's box of what is causing the backscatter. Well, the thread was actually closed after the second page. You're kidding. Quite a curt comment, no conspiracy ah. here. Someone is terrified of simple qu Wow, isn't that special? Anyway, so did the questioner ever get an answer? Oh yes, people came up with answers and, and the questioner, I think, knew, the, knew that there was a, 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 a mundane answer to it anyway because he started putting up some videos uh, of his own on, the, on the, an effect called the sea. Also known as the opposition surge effect, or opposition spike effect, uh, which, uh, when you've got the sun behind you, uh, can uh, operate on uh, distances between planets. So sometimes planets can get a bright spot when they're, when they're opposition to the Earth. Uh, so Mars, you know, there's a great picture out there I found. I haven't put it up. A great picture of Mars from NASA uh, showing a bright spot on the centre of Mars caused by this effect, uh, and uh, so and, and so anyway. So the um, so when uh, you know a few weeks ago put up that video showing that tracking glint across Jezero Crater. You know, if you're non-technical like me, you're thinking, uh, could this be just a feature of the camera? Uh, but having found this, I, I this, this, um, to some people, well-known effect, the Zealing effect, uh, we can say that it actually is something, a glint tracking across the, the surface of, uh, of uh, Jezero Crater as the, perseverance descends and it actually can also be found on video of um, Curiosity rover descending towards um, Oh now that's the, interesting because Ron and I have been name. discussing is there a dome over Gale Crater which is three times the size of Yezero it's almost a hundred miles across it has this peak in the center so called Mount Sharp that you could anchor a dome to. You know, you put the constructional supports on the peak and then you spread your dome out around it. But if, if the dome ever existed, 
given what I've seen of a lot of Curiosity imagery, it has to be much older than the Ezero's dome and pretty much almost non-existent. So did you did you look at the comparative video between Curiosity and the Ezero? Yes, if people go to the fast link items okay. and click click on Bob. None Bob. Items. Now we want to go down to item number eight. Great. Ah, gift of perseverance landing. So okay. this this shows a, a short gif of that from uh, tracking. We yeah. just might see it. From one of two cameras that photographed on the way down, the color camera and the black and white lander vision system camera. And if you get out of that and click on it's, it's quite a long uh, video curiosity coming down, but quite early on uh, and until about 50% in, into the video, is the uh, lander swings about under its parachute. Okay, there goes the heat shield. Oh, I can see it right above the heat shield. I never noticed it. A very bright. Oh, uh, yeah. It's really good effect. It, it's it's gone out of frame. That's why I didn't notice it, because, it will, because unlike it will on... Go ahead. It comes back again. You can see it. Okay. I, oh yeah, I see it now. Look at that. I never noticed. See, even if you're, you think you're a good observer, when you encounter something which is really kind of outside your experience, yeah, it's, it's, it, now it's too close to see. It appears at the top of the video when the heat shield goes away, and it comes back in briefly, and now I think we're too close to see it. Oh, this is from Malin's camera. Really amazing video. Wow. So, number 10. Just shut that down for a moment. Uh, is a wiki a Wikipedia explanation of the effect. Um, okay, well, the Seliger effect, or the backscatter effect, or the anti-sun effect, I mean, we, we talked about all of these many weeks ago, is created when you have a medium in front of you, which is backscattering sunlight, which is behind you, and kicking it back like one of those 3M signs where there's little glass beads embedded in a matrix, which is why they reflect back light so brightly at night. And I told you the story of my friend Charlie, whose son was killed going up the long uh, ramp on the, on the mass turnpike. And he spent the rest of his life developing to embed in the, in the on-ramps and the off-ramps these little colored disks, which were red for no, 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 do not go up this, you know. So even in deep fog, someone looking over their hood where their headlights are looking like three or four feet in front of the car, they would see that they were on the wrong ramp, turn around and not get killed like Charlie's son did. So this is a well-known effect. 3M put it into a screen back when we had, you know, slide projectors and movie projectors and they wanted the, the, the glass beads embedded in the matrix to kick light back. What I'm saying is it's not so much the effect as what's causing the effect because the brightness of these glints tells me the surface has to have a high percentage of glass. Now on Earth, you can also get this from the atmosphere. If you're in an airplane looking down through thin clouds, the water droplets beneath you opposite the sun will kick back this, this light, this backscatter, this Seliger effect, so that you can see it and even photograph it. I've seen it many times, particularly when you're going into or out of airports, because the condensation close to the ground is different than at altitude where the air is much drier. Or you can see it on the moon, where you see astronauts and you'll see their shadows, and then around their heads, which is where the camera is up near their chest, you'll see this bright halo of light. It's not that these are supernatural astronauts or saints walking on the moon, it's at the lunar surface because it has a 50% concentration of little glass beads. Kicks the light back 
toward the camera during Apollo unlike any other normal surface. When you go out to the desert, when you go out to any landscape, most soils, most terrains do not do this. It requires very special conditions with an active optical medium in the soil, in the upper few microns of the soil, to give you that kickback because the rays of the sun have to go in, bounce around inside the little glass particle, and then come back out basically the same way they came in, and those conditions are not met in most soils on Earth. Certainly, uh, you know, when you're flying into airports, in most places you don't see this, because the atmosphere has to be right for it to happen in the air, and humidity and moisture and little cloud droplets. So what was the bottom line of the discussion? Did they say, oh, it's just a natural phenomenon and move on? I think anybody who read this thread would have um, learned that it was a natural phenomenon. <laughs> uh, but I don't it was, um, it was quite such a, the, the fellow who posted it seemed to be probably some like Russia or Ukraine going by his name. Uh, so I don't, I don't know why the hostility may be another thread. He is a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> but um, Item number 11 on my items is a video of the effect on uh, taken from drones uh, showing the, the, the effect on very you know, surfaces that are not very reflective. Um, and uh, if you look at that, what you can see is that although non-reflective surfaces. Uh, no, wait, 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 wait. I'm just looking at them flying over a tennis court and the grass is doing the same thing. Because yes, remember, grass, I... grass, now I'm looking at a tennis court where it's barely visible here because of the alignment of the blades of grass. Remember, grass blades are shiny and I can see the shadow of the, of the drone. Um, these are very, these are special artificial environments, like that look like astroturf, yeah. you know. Uh, there is something of a beach and uh, other places, but the, well, um, beach sand is made the, of what? Yeah, yeah. So the in interesting. Hang on, thing hang on, is hang the, on. What is yeah. beach sand made of? Silica. Silicon dioxide, which is glass. Yeah. There are no beaches so what, on Mars. One one of the things that comes out of video is that the effect is very weak. Oh, incredibly uh, weak on Earth, yeah. Not on reflective surface, you know, on matte surfaces. And it, he's had to, t he or she has had to turn down the gamma to, uh, to bring it out. So, um, so it can, it, so you can, yeah. Yeah, oh, Ron, what go about ahead. Snow? Oh, sorry, what about snow? We had, I haven't seen it on snow. <laughs> snow should be brilliant. I, I have seen it for myself on the fairways of the local golf course when it was closed for lockdown. I've been walking the fairways and even though the grass is quite matte, uh, rain is aligned at all in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And I've had this ceiling effect around my head. Uh, so it's quite interesting to see it for myself. Yeah, I'm seeing in this video, they say, you know, enhanced contrast, enhanced contrast. Yeah. It, it's, it's nothing like what we're seeing on Mars. No, it's much brighter in those two uh, videos of the uh, yep. descents. Yep. Yep. See, and this gets us back to the idea of, well, what's causing it on the surface of Mars? And my, you know, initial hypothesis was there had to be a lot of glass in the surface. And if you look now at, at the closest images taken with the mass cam or with the super cam, we, you can see trillions of little glass beads in the soil, in the regolith of Mars. And those beads are what's causing this opposition effect, this silicon effect. I mean, I'm looking at the, oh, it's barely perceptible on this Earth video. And then it has to be enhanced to see it well. We saw it on a video from, from Perseverance, and it wasn't enhanced at all, it was just there, blatantly there.
so that's one of their efforts. And what I find interesting is you say that after this discussion got started, they closed the thread. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. That's telltale. Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? Who's afraid to talk about opposition surges when you land on certain craters on Mars? And again, going back to Ron's model, which is where this whole thing, that's why I was caught up by the sun glint, because as soon as I saw it, I thought, oh my God, you know, Gerbron is right. At some point in Martian history, they used the craters as places of occupation and agriculture and habitation when the atmosphere was no longer habitable. And lo and behold, that's what we have found. Now, what was this, this email that I heard was going around <clears throat> where someone claimed that the whole idea of domes on Mars is silly because you can breathe the atmosphere? Andrew? Uh, yes. <laughs> Sorry, Richard. I was looking at Bob's materials. It's amazing. Uh, yeah, you want me to read it? Yeah, please. <laughs> Okay, hang on a sec here. Uh, oh boy, can you talk while I find it? Because I just have to relocate. This it. is live Please. radio. We can actually watch <laughs> over your shoulder. Remember, everything is bugged. My little uh, mouse, by the way, is being very, very insistent. I think he wants me to go do something. You know, I oh have yeah, his, you have. I have this little mouse, which has been galloping over my big um, um, cat that Robin got me for one of my birthdays many years ago right next to the console where we're right on the show and he's been not only running up and down the, the large stuffed cat which is not a cat it's kind of a symbol from a cat it's very you know kind of the art deco but he's been running around on my <clears throat> on my console i now know keith has been changing my settings <laughs> oh boy but you have to excuse me folks i just have i did a lot of yard work today my allergies are kicking up. I don't have COVID. It's just <laughs> an itchy nose. Uh, let me read to you uh, what was so the little back and forth was. Um, do you want me to start with yours? Or you want me to just go right to the response? No, no, just go right to the response. Okay, hold on a minute there. I've probably been looking in minute detail at these locations, not a little, but a lot more than you have. I've also been doing far more pans and quite intellectually honest courage. I'm sure I'm exhibiting it. You can't stitch sky images together unless they're connected to the horizon and even then the sky is simply blended while the horizon is stitched the stitching is done by edge pixel matching there's not enough variance in the sky for it to be matched nonetheless those sky images you refer to are not a sky panorama they're sky flats which are stacked and used to flat field balance and clean up the images that's what holger was talking about so this is the same um comment. I use them in my image processing. They are most often repeated images of the same spot of a blank sky. Uh, there you go. And then the comment is, Mars didn't bleed to death, needing domes to gather straggling survivors trying to breathe. You don't need giant domes in an atmosphere. So there, that's the premise. Mm. Um, now, Ron mm. answered. I don't know if Ron wants to answer, but what he said... <laughs> oh, yeah. But, why, don't, why don't we read Ron's answer? Do you want me to read it, Ron? Is that okay? Yeah, I don't have a copy of it. I just did it off the cuff when I saw it, when I read the email. Yeah, but, yeah and, go ahead. Yeah, and everybody, this is just really good. We have to have opposing sides to figure this out, and these are excellent points. So Ron's response was, I never heard them called sky flats, but that's on me. I know what you're talking about. On a purely technical level, I know he's referencing stuff which does get done for mundane reasons. He's definitely correct that it isn't easy to even try to align frames with little or no distinct content. Now, a systematic mapping operation could be plotted by time codes, etc., but it would be pretty hard to reconstruct from the outside of such an operation without all, without all that ancillary data from the left, right, descending spiral, or quadrants. Was it comprehensive, or did it sample a sequence of zones? I think the sheer number of those flats, in this case, is strong, strongly indicative of an actual search, which, which, again, Richard referenced, they did it again this week, rather than just collecting extra filler. But it is not enough to base a theory upon. It is, however, enough to make a supportive cause for possibilities like those. Hmm. 
You want to give us the cliff hmm. notes on what you said there toward the end? Because I, I think I lost the thread. Well, the, my thought was that they're looking for something, which, to my mind, uh, this is a sort of a backhanded acceptance of the uh, of that other model, uh, because if you're looking for uh, holes, you know, or danger points, something that's peering on the edge and just about to come crashing down to the surface from, you know, who knows what sort of perturbation might happen from your the noise you make or the or vibrations you start, uh, then, you know, you might just kind of scattershot look around and say, are there really any holes to worry about, et cetera. Um, that's what I was thinking. The idea that you would um, map it, well, that seems unnecessary unless they're quite sure. I mean, I agree with you, Richard, that you would, uh, you would get some content to match things up with if you enhance the pictures first. Well, see, that's... A, all right, let me, let, let me go step by step and take yeah. apart this, this uh, expert, okay? First, James Bell, who is the scientist who's the principal investigator of the mass cam zoom cameras, the two dual-mounted bore-sided cameras, both of them telephoto, four-to-one zooms, um, he says in the copious literature which has been published on the MassCam Z system that occasionally during the mission they will take a couple, that's two, flat field frames during the latter parts of an extended mission to check the amount of dust that's fallen on the little color charts, which Tim and I had discussions uh, couple, three weeks ago about how accurate they were and how useful. There is a brilliant red, green, and blue um, in, in, in duplicate on Perseverance right in front of the camera so we can see the colors. <clears throat> well, the dust that they keep saying is falling out of the sky and covering everything on Mars will tend to obscure and mute and kind of blur those colors together. So they can't use them unless the wind blows away the dust, which has happened on a number of missions. Um, so they do what's called flat fielding. You take pictures of a blank surface of known luminosity, like the sky, which on Earth is used by astronomers, I said, before and after their evening observing runs to flat field to calibrate the frames they're taking during their observing program. <clears throat> Bell said they're going to do the same thing they did on Curiosity. They plan to do it on Perseverance. But you don't take hundreds of pictures of the entire sky more than once within two weeks to flat field because all you need is a couple of frames of a neutral part of the sky at a certain angle from the sun so you get the scatter, etc. And the Martian sky is much more reliably boring, we've been told, than Earth skies. So it only takes a couple of frames. So you wouldn't waste the bandwidth the time, the energy, the plotting, the computer time, all of that to photograph the entire sky. Not once, but twice. So that part of his explanation is out the window. That's not why they're doing this. They are definitely searching for something. And I think, Ron, you're probably onto something. You're looking for things that are closer to Percy than farther away. Because if you're flying a helicopter and the dome is not a thin sheet of crystal, or didn't used to be, but in fact has stuff hanging down now. If you move the rover, which they've been doing in increments, and you take photographs of the same sky over and over again, you get parallax, you get motion, you get trigonometry, you get a 3D potential of putting together a 3D model of the stuff, the glass stuff that's hanging down that you don't want your little helicopter to fly into and um, so that that's the first thing is you wouldn't take the entire sky to do flat fielding number two Richard yes Richard um, you have about 60 oh, seconds oh, I yes. want to ask you I want to ask you a question after the break um, about this as well okay I'm glad someone was watching the time because when I get into these things it's kind of hard to be an impresario as well as running engineering you're on the other side of midnight having this interesting conversation about the reality of a dome over the crater on Mars that Perseverance landed in. 
If you're wondering how a spacecraft can land in a crater covered by a dome, well, the dome is no longer really a dome. It's moth-eaten, it's eroded, it's fragmentary, and obviously, if you look at the imagery we presented, about half of it in the western part is missing. There's just enough left to cause amazing optical effects. When we come back, I want to show you. We're on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard C. Hoagland, the cast of thousands. midnight.com Tune in to listen to Richard C. Hogland and his fascinating guests. Support the broadcast and don't miss another groundbreaking conversation. Join Club 19.5 to get access to exclusive member benefits. Listen to past episodes anytime on any device. Search the archives of over 180 episodes. Membership costs $9.95 a month, 33 cents a day. Talk radio at the cutting edge of science and thought. The other side of midnight.com. Side of Midnight for this Saturday, April 17th. My guests, Andrew, Ron, Tim, Bob, Keith, Kintia, who's very, very, very silent. Maybe she'll say something because the artwork of this dome is really incredibly impressive. Anyway, Andrew, you had something you wanted to add. Yeah, I did, and or do, and I know... Um our researcher there, he would probably ask the same question. And Tim kind of brought it up when he talked about the helicopter and the Martian dust that was sort of or sand that that's gathering on top of the on top of the um, solar panel. Is would we see or can we see, especially if there's a big dust storm, dust or Martian dust, dust gathering on the remnants of the dome? Like, would that become more obvious, or would it blow right back off? Given the past history of, of Mars missions, starting with little Perseverance, remember it had this little tiny microwave oven-sized rover called Sojourner that yep. supposedly was named after Sojourner Truth, who was one of the spearheads of the Underground Railway uh, for, for uh, slaves freeing to freedom in Canada. Uh, literally parts of the railway were underground, you know, and yeah. I think, Ron, that you stepped in one on your farm in uh, Pennsylvania when you were a kid. You fell through the roof and, lo and behold, found yourself in the middle of the Underground Railway. Uh, that's actually true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it's a right great story and it has the advantage of being true. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, well, I didn't know that it was relevant here. Yeah, there was a, a little orchard, uh, what you'd call a heritage orchard. Uh, Distinct varieties of common fruits that were around the revolutionary times that aren't now. This was that uh, And the, the the ground was always kind of springy uh, there in the orchard. But one day I'm walking along and all of a sudden, whoosh, I fall through, fall down about 10 feet and I end up in water. And uh, I look up and there's all this vaulted brickwork. Wow. This is beautiful, beautiful colonial style brickwork just going off in all directions. I mean, literally, there were like three branches that I could see going off, and uh, me standing in a foot of water. And I said, oh! So I, I managed to get someone's attention, and they 
dropped down a ladder and I got out of there. But yeah, that was part of the literal underground railway. Uh, okay, the reason the, this uh, is relevant is because NASA, when they named Little Sojourner first rover on Mars, a quote, technological test, remember? A, a techni technical demonstration like the Perseverance you know, helicopter is supposed to be. <clears throat> They named it Sojourner. They said after Sojourner Truth, who was spearheading the Underground Railway for Freed Slaves. When in fact, Sojourner also applies to a lodge member of a Masonic lodge that goes from one lodge to another. So the fact that Little Pathfinder and Sojourner were packaged in a tetrahedral package, a tetrahedral pyramid, just like those flying in the Navy video that I talked about at the beginning of the show. And they landed little Pathfinder slash Sojourner at 19.5 degrees on Mars, which again is the circumscribed angle of a tetrahedron. And they named their rover Sojourner as a missionary from one Masonic Lodge to another. Again, NASA, never a straight answer. Okay. Um, so back to Andrew. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so if if there's dust storms, just like again, like the way Tim pointed out, the helicopter has you know we can see the picture or the photograph of the dust or the Martian regolith kind of gathering on top of the solar panel. That weird little thing tapped on top that Tim you know assiduously pointed out. Could that be happening with? The remnants of the dome. I mean, would, would we see Martian dust or sand, you know, sort of spewing or, do you know what I mean? Like hanging on that Well, this goes or... back to the Sojourner story, because what they expected, what NASA expected as yeah. a technical demonstration is they'd send this little rover with its solar panel to Mars. It would yeah. crawl around, the dust storms would come, the dust would fall out of the sky, and soon the solar panel would be useless, right? right. Yeah. Did not happen. On the succeeding mission, on um, the Athena missions, uh, Opportunity and Spirit, uh, every once in a while, something, it turned out to be dust devils, Mars is dust devil heaven, would come along. These are like dry, um, uh, yeah. electromagnetically driven uh, whirlwinds, like yeah. little tornadoes. They would come and they would blow all the dust off the solar panels and their power consumption would go from almost, you know, 30% up to 100% for months and months and months and months, and then they would slowly accumulate more dust and then another dust devil. So no, the dome on Mars should be cleaned periodically by the winds, by vortices. We actually have spotted on one of the uh, Perseverance images of yeah. the temple, the Kodiak temple, there are two dust devils that have appeared in the cameras on that flat plain between where um, the Temple Butte sits and the far crater rim. There's a flat space there, you can see on the uh, MRO imagery looking down, which is conducive, obviously, thermally for creating dust devils. So, no, I think the glass is pretty clean because periodic storms on Mars, particularly if the density of the atmosphere is a lot higher than we've been told, these surfaces should be clean. So it's a really dynamic environment. Very, this is a very. So let me let me go to my number fourteen. All right, you know how to get there. Remember, click on uh, Richard's items um, under the banner when you get to the guest page. Take the number fourteen. Um, this individual who's telling us how he cannot put together mosaics of the sky because they're all blank. Well, Ron touched on it a few moments ago. Uh, you want to click on this number 14 and make it full screen, all right? Because you want to look at the exquisite moth-eaten glass geometry of the dome over Yezero. And you will see two dark spots, one in the upper right corner and the other over on the left side, about almost halfway down the, down the frame. This is an image taken by the mass cam looking almost straight up. The object on the right appears to be something which is obscuring 
the glass geometry behind it. Can everybody see that? It's semi-transparent. It's not black. It's like, it's, it's attenuating the light, but it's not totally obscuring the light. And then the circle over on the left turns out to be a reflection of the dark spot, darker spot on the right, because you can see the mirror geometry of the dome reflected point for point and detail for detail in that curving arc on the left of the frame. And what I should do someday in my copious spare time is to take an arrow and actually point out individual features and that this is a reflection what's called a total uh, grazing incidence reflection obviously tim of one of your pillars one of your supports which is rising up from behind perseverance because we're near one edge of the dome and you're seeing it in the sky when bell took and pointed his mass cam overhead and started taking the mosaics so to this anonymous critique of what I'm recommending, which is to make a mosaic, stitch together all the frames of the sky, as Ron said a moment ago, you don't take the blank frames, you process each frame, and then like a beautiful, gorgeous color mosaic, or a um, Islamic tile, or a Renaissance cathedral stained glass window, you fit the frames together to match and map out all the stunning geometry we can see of the dome, problem solved. I have got the feeling, guys, particularly Andrew, that this guy, even though he has the technical capability, does not want to do this either, A, because of what he's terrified of finding, that we're right, that NASA's lying, or B, someone has told him to like the guys, you know, writing on the Seeliger thread to basically get rid of this, uh, you know, bothersome uh, citizen scientist out here who's raising all kinds of uncomfortable questions because you never want to have them put together a mosaic because then everybody on the Earth will see the dome. Well, I can okay. tell you right now. Go ahead, Andrew. Go, Andrew. Go. Well, when I look at 13, Richard. 13, okay. Yeah, we're, we're out of sequence. I was going to do um, oh, 11, sorry. 12, and 13 momentarily. Oh, but, okay, okay. Well I, well, I can do it now, okay? 11, 12, and 13. 11 is an image that I found. 12 is an image that Ron sent to me for a totally different purpose. And I went, oh, my God, look at that. And I'll explain what the that is in a moment. And then 13 is another processing of an image we discussed with Holger last weekend. So let's go back to 11. This is a photograph with the sun basically high overhead. It's high noon, not on the moon, but on Mars. Okay, there are no shadows. The field is flat. You can see the two tread tracks of little Percy's wheels. They're not little, they're little large. And on the horizon, you see this bizarre bright oval surrounded by a succession of ovals that extend up out of frame into the sky. Now, I've looked at a million, you know, high noon shots here in New Mexico. I have never seen an incredibly oval, elliptical uh, brilliance at the horizon, which is beyond the, the farthest mountains because you can clearly see that the brightness does not extend down over that uh, crater rim, which is beyond the temple, which is the dark object just to the left of center on the near horizon. Now you scroll down to number 12. This was an image Ron sent me for a totally different purpose, and the thing that leaped out at me is we're now looking about 90 degrees to the first image. So if the first image is looking west, this image is looking kind of north, and it's roughly the same time. It's a different day, but it's the same time of day because they're taking a lot of shots with the sun like at high noon. And you can see the shadows on the objects in, in the foreground, the rocks, some of them are rocks and some of them are not. There's almost no shadows, so the sun is coming directly down. But again, you see this enhanced brightness, this halo behind the peaks 
in the background. So whatever's causing the scattering is beyond the near field objects. And finally, number 13, this is a photograph taken, oh, image, digital image taken by the uh, nav cams. Uh, looking again west, you can see the temple there, you can see the background uh, ridges which are the crater rim, and then you see a brightness at the horizon, and then you see another brightness at the very top of the frame. The, according to the numbers, the, the dates and times of when this was sent down, which NASA is providing us, you know, they're providing us all the data, but they make us put it all together ourselves, meaning it's very, very Masonic. If you don't ask the right question, you won't get the right answer. Masonic up to the, uh, up to the 33rd degree, whatever. Anyway, the brightness at the top is the sun. The brightness at the horizon and that cone of light extending down from the sun in both directions radiating out. You can see the kind of radiating isocontour lines. That is only geometrically possible if you're photographing the sun from inside the goldfish bowl, from inside the dome, what's left of it. And there was so much of it <clears throat> that even though it's a bare, you know, trace of what it used to be, there's enough to be optically significant and to create extraordinary optical effects that I have seen in no other surface imagery shot by any mission to the surface of Mars going back to the original Viking mission. Now, Andrew. Yes. Uh, well, the thing that stands out to me on... Okay, let's go back to 11, because they all kind of tie together richer. So if we go to number 11 of Richard's items... Okay, we've talked about this before, and I'm noticing it more and more and more, but if you look at those distant hills, there is such an incredible glow, like bands of glow, that it, it, it almost looks like a soup of color, like sitting in these valleys, right? It's, it, it pops out over and over again, and to me, you only get that effect. Like, I see a lot of that here in the West Coast, because we have a lot of moisture in the air. There's a lot of atmosphere, and you get a, you know, you get a fading background. Um, now, we get the colors of the trees here, but this is incredible, Richard. There's a real, like glow in like almost like it's a like a reservoir color sitting in these valleys and I, I, either they're that color or there's something optically going on it's the same thing in number 12 if you look at the distant left those back hills are even brighter mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're brighter it's like, uh, a, it's like a Monet watercolor yeah go ahead Ron. Andrew yes yeah they since since there's that one, which, uh, yes, there's a version of it in my section as well. Uh, when you put it, when we, we do not have a two-week lead time on every show for all the listeners out there. And a lot of stuff gets uh, uh, put together that, oh, my God, can we use this? Oh, should we use that? And so it did, yeah, we have there's duplication sometimes. Sorry. Uh, but the... Uh, so, wait, wait, wait. Are, nice you saying, of, are you saying we should go to your images? Uh it wouldn't make any difference. You did. This is the uh, this is the same image oh, okay, in my okay. section as well. So we can deal with this since we're here. All right. Got other stuff. Right. Uh, the uh, there's a nice rainbow on it. Uh, you know, and I I resisted the urge to pump it up a little bit so that you could so that that was more distinct. You know, so this is a pretty this is a pretty naked image. But the uh, if you look at it, and I I assume if you click on it, you get the larger version. If uh, anybody that yep. wants to look at it Full and look frame. very carefully at the yeah at the color, it extends down to the edge of the ridge, let's call it the, the you know the foreground, uh, but no further. You can see very clearly it goes down into there, but not down onto the image. So therefore, it's not a just a lens it effect. It can't be in and, the and camera. No, exactly. And the other thing, guys, and I've noticed this over and over again, is that so for instance in this number better make sure I'm on the right number. Number 12. Um, and it's the same thing in Richard's images. Again, if you look at the coloring, at the lighting effect in the foreground, middle ground, it's almost dampened. Like I've been talking about, I've been trying to find images of, anybody could do this. Go look up uh, uh, greenhouses, like large industrial greenhouses on a cloudy day. 
and there's just this even lighting that's going on. Now you, you can say, well, have diffused exactly. sunlight. And yet in the background, those distant hills are lit up, like I said, as if it's like, wow, I want to go over there and hang out where that warm hill is. And you see that over and over again. And that's my point. Is, and, and, and not just that, but the sky is extraordinary. Like if we could get a, you know, a gigapan of this, it'd be, I think it'd be really beautiful. But it's that haze, Richard, in the background, again, when you're number 13, it just, it, it looks so atmospheric. And I mean, I see that kind of thing, like I say, where we have a lot of moisture here on the west coast so it's either it's either they've got a lot of moisture there on Mars or there's something else going on awesome. and it's right there it's yes. not far far away it's, exactly. it's between the foreground in the pictures and that uh, arcology there you are Richard uh, that hill which is actually an arcology uh, yes. back behind it and you can see very distinctly that that's uh, well, I hate to use a word like fuzzy because it's perfectly fine, but I mean it's it's optically degraded slightly yes. compared to the foreground, which is very very sharp, and that's yes. because there's something in between. And anyone who doubts that, I got one more thing: if you blow that up, even just the primary image, blow it up a little bit, and look to the left uh, about midway from uh, the center to the left, and at the very top edge, you see that little dark spot. Yes. That's not an image flaw because it's not in other images in the same location. It's not dirt. It's something stuck to the dome. I'm convinced. Okay. There's other dark I spots think on the... I, I think I may have an answer because Ron and I have been going back and forth. <clears throat> he says these are yeah. holes. That was his initial thing. And in a brilliant dome with multiple layers and scattering, why would you have a hole that would be dark? Because it wouldn't. It would just blend in. The next thing, the, the next thing he said, well, it's something stuck in the dome, which is dark, which is a useful model. Then you have to ask yourself, well, what could be stuck in the dome? And then I realized, remember that pan I was going to send you the other night of the ground in front of Curiosity? And there was this curious dune, which had these little dime-sized holes in it that were very shallow, but a different color. And someone said in a chat thread, oh, it looks like these are raindrops. You know how it starts to rain, big drops? And if you're in a sandy terrain, the drops go down, they go splat, and you get this pattern of little depressions in the sand from falling raindrops. Well, there's no falling raindrops on Mars, so what could it be? Then some bright guy said, well, we're so-and-so uh, uh, you know, feet away from the landing site. Could this be debris from the sky crane? which of course blasted the surface with six rockets lowering two-ton perseverance to the surface on the cables, and the rocket blast eroded the surface. You can see it as these two bright areas in the satellite image you're looking down on both sides of perseverance. And if all that stuff was lofted into the air because of the blast of the rockets, it had to go somewhere. And I'm thinking now, Ron, that what we're seeing is stuck in the dome fairly close to the rover from the landing of the rover itself and Percy's sky crane rockets. Okay. Okay. And it would be dark. That would it would be yes, new. That would be good. It would it would mm -hmm. still be hanging around, it's stuck there. And it's another reason why that you really want to map your dome in case you fly your helicopter into a piece of glass in which the debris from the sky crane got stuck. See how it all fits together? Or Richard, what uh, about? Go ahead, Andrew. What about the, yeah. the covering that that was um, sort of popped off before the parachute came out? All that debris went flying up into the. Yeah, but that's so tiny, 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 and it landed miles and miles downrange because okay. at that point they were still moving thousand miles an hour remember when they popped the parachute right that stuff had huge momentum it did not land anywhere near perseverance which is the segue to timothy tim are you there in your echoing amphitheater i absolutely am yes oh i Just love that sound gosh we have to we have Excellent. to we have to you know we have to package that anyway this segues directly to you because if you go and look at my frames number 13 12 and particularly 11 
and I might add 10. There's got to be a way in your incredible computer uh, program that you're going to talk about in terms of modeling the dome to put in the lighting characteristics and the scattering functions so with ray tracing we literally get a da Vinci model of what the light should look like when the sun is at high noon and there's no possible way it produce any brilliance at as an oval at the horizon. Well, there are many things that which are possible with the software I have and other people have, but uh, what we, what you're doing there is you're you're mixing up a, a few different types of software which which don't necessarily give you a the result you're looking for. I mean, where where I'm coming from is that we need to join dots to to make assumptions. Those assumptions allow me to model something as a, as a 3D model of what we think a dome could be. And you know, I underline that this, this I treat the whole of all of this as a blue sky project. I affectionately call it a blue sky project because what I mean by that is I do not want to limit my imagination by in, 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 in the conceptual stage. So I'm exploring uh, along the way and along the way I'm finding there are dots which are joining, which I join and there are also dots that are joining because there are absolute features which match up on the terrain. Oh. And those, those are the ones which I find fascinating because as, as you always say, uh, we need to, you know, extract the, the data from the noise. And uh, that, that's what I'm looking to do, is to draw the conclusions from what we're finding on the terrain. Okay. So, so Richard, just, just to go back, I mean, yes, if there well, is a let me, let, me, let, let, let me set the terrain here. We've got four minutes to the, about, the top of the hour. <clears throat> so give us a, an overview, and then when we come back, we'll go point by point by point, because you have some very interesting images. Well, thank you. So, first of all, let me just give you a few dimensions. This, this may fit in quite nicely before the break. If you count me down, Keith. Um, the, the diameter of Jazeera Crater is 54 kilometers. That's around 18 miles. The height of the proposed dome, which I'll show you on the drawings after the break, uh, is 8.3 kilometers high which is around 5.1 miles. The supports or columns, which I also think they could be uh, sort of communication elevators, they could be ways in, ways out, for, for they could be way, you know, but they're huge. So they are two kilometers in diameter, uh, which is 1.24 miles in diameter. Um, and the area of Jazeera Crater which I'm, I'm defining is 1,875 square kilometers, which is 724 square miles. Um, so when we look at these images, a pixel is 82 meters, which is something in the region of 270 feet. So, you know, what does all that mean? It means that when we start measuring and creating uh, shapes, we can put different layers of uh, geometry and apply that geometry and draw conclusions from, from all of that data. Uh, so when the, there are features that you know, really do emerge on, on the terrain and they happen to match up with a, a particular you know, sort of polygonal uh, sided, multi-sided feature, then you know I'm entering that information, but when there are literally features that match up in eight of the twelve places I would expect there to be a feature, if that if that polygonal you know, shape is correct, but if there are eight out of twelve on the surface, then that to me is very intriguing indeed. So I think we're coming up to the break. Richard. We are coming up um, to the witching hour. So hold it there, everyone. My guest this. engineer in his classical spare time he is designing or retro designing or reconstructing Martian glass domes and the point-by-point -point comparisons he was alluding to are really gripping and again the preponderance of evidence of everything we've assembled over the last several weeks we've been doing this says in fact 
this dome is real. So why doesn't NASA admit to it? Why don't they just tell us the truth? Well, stay tuned. You're on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard C. Hoagland. Richard C. Hoagland here. I'd like you to support the other side of midnight by subscribing to Club 1995 and thereby joining our unique growing radio community. Tune in to listen to our fascinating guests, pioneers on the out there edge of science and thought, and gain access to exclusive member benefits. To do this, just visit our website, theothersideofmidnight.com, and click on the Join Club 19.5 link in the navigator bar or in the left hand column. Membership costs $19.95 a month. That's 33 tetrahedral cents a day. I mean, it's the price of a couple of cups of coffee. As a Club 19.5 member, you'll gain access to this show and literally hundreds of previous shows on hundreds of different topics going back to 2015 that we've done. Our archive shows have the commercials removed and you'll be able to download the MP3 files directly from the 19 point archives if you prefer. To enhance your listener experience, a new The Other Side of Midnight podcast is being added to all show pages, which will allow you to instantly search the show archives and reading with pictures, thus easily accessing the corresponding show. Plus, you can just as quickly access the entire podcast list when you're on the go. I want to personally thank all our Club 19.5 members because without your continuing support, this show would literally not be on the air. Please continue supporting the broadcast that provides you with the most interesting conversation available, talk radio at the cutting edge of science and thought, and if you like what you hear on the other side of midnight, tell your friends, and continue growing the show by having them subscribe to Club 19.5 as well because we need all of you when i say we need you you're the reason we're doing all this oakland over and out welcome back everyone it is now the witching hour here in the land of enchantment in this gorgeous desert, which I am so lucky to inhabit, with a crescent moon overhead, sparkling stars. You know, you wonder if they are going to take images of Phobos and Deimos with the Perseverance cameras. All, you know, how many cameras can look up? There's the mass cam, there's the nav cam, there's the Super cam, there's the Madeira sky cam deliberately. It's a 180 degree lens looking directly up. In other words, all of these incredibly utilitarian cameras, if they were to photograph uh, Phobos, which is the inner moon of Mars, goes around Mars once every uh, seven hours and change, or Deimos, which is much farther away and takes uh, like a day and a half to go around Mars once. If they were to photograph these celestial objects, which in the Curiosity cameras were big enough to show features and craters and you can see eclipses and all this, imagine if they photographed Phobos or Deimos through the dome and we could actually look at the optical distortions of the surface features as they went behind varying densities remaining of the layers of the dome. I mean, the ability to monitor this sky phenomenon is phenomenal. Are they going to do it? Probably. 
Are they going to tell us? Well, that is why we're doing these shows. Because ultimately, it's up to you. If you out there in Radio Land, in 190 some countries listening to the other side of midnight, if you send emails, if you begin to, you know, petition NASA to tell us the truth about the dome, tell us the truth about the dome, eventually something is going to break. Someone, somewhere, will have a conscience or will gather courage or wind up with larger kahunes, who knows what. In fact, we're seeing some interesting non-vocal responses from the Perseverance team in the sense that since we've been talking about this, they have been taking more pictures of the sky at different times of day, allowing us to reconstruct the optical scattering geometry of being inside, essentially, a glass fishbowl. That's why we have those interesting ovals around the horizon. No matter which azimuth you look at high noon, something which does not happen in an ordinary atmosphere. So let's go back to Tim Saunders and his remarkably perspicacious at this point with limited data reconstruction of the geometry of the Juzero Dome. Well, thank you. Firstly, I'd like to uh, congratulate who made the, the artwork for the, the, the show banner tonight. I think it looks excellent. Um, I'm sure Kim Thia had something to do with it, but um, I think that really sets the mood for the evening. And ultimately, I do intend to bring the, the study I'm doing to something which is far more in line with that, which is like a finished rendering, or rendering from inside and also outside of, of the dome. Um, but currently, I am very much focused on the geometry and the architecture and not at all interested in the color. I'm sorry, Richard, I know you are particularly, <laughs> but I, I, to me, also the design spiral I, I, I work on with, uh, with my yachts as well. I rarely ever start with color until the geometry and the architecture is in place because I find it tends to distract. In this particular case, because we're reverse engineering, I can understand why the color is important and it is obviously a major factor in, in the dot connecting we're doing. So I get it, but we're doing a slightly adapted uh, process here. So before we depart my, uh, your section of photographs, let's just look at your photograph on number 14, Mars Perseverance ZRO0035. You know, what we're lo doing is looking up and we can see a uh, it's, it's actually a beautiful piece of art. I quite Isn't like to hang it, it on it's my wall. Even. Stunning. Yeah. It's stunning. It's, if it weren't so gorgeous, it would be pathetic to be ignored. But the fact that it's both engineeringly accurate, because it's a real picture of something on Mars, as well as aesthetically astonishing. Can you imagine what this looked like when it was new? Because I'm imagining, Kim, we're not looking like an inverted salad bowl. The Martians, whoever they were, they had an incredible artistic sense. Ron has found, you know, murals and friezes and all that and a lot of the curiosity imagery. These people, this was a planet of art, not the planet of war. So the fact that they're ignoring it at several different levels is a crime, not just against science, it's a crime against humanity. That's interesting that the Earth, or Jasun, perspective of Mars is that it is a planet of war. Perhaps that is more more of an overview that we we, we were the losers. We were not the victors. <laughs> exactly. But, um, that, that's another conversation. But let's just focus on this, this photograph for a second. Um, you know, it clearly it is looking up. It's like it's like almost if you do scuba diving, if you look up, I've not done very much, but when you do look up, you see, obviously, um, the, the, sort of the, the levels of blue going towards the, the, the lighter color, which is obviously the atmosphere. We have the change of density between the water and the sky above. Now we have a, a similar, but very different situation going on here. Um, but clearly there is more light at the top. 
that's because of a, a lot of reasons we can get into slightly uh, shortly. Um, but what's very interesting is that we also see like the interface or the intersection between two facets, I believe, on the left hand side, which is the, you know, I, I'm, I have tried to force feed the uh, the terrain with various different types, different number of and polygon polygons with different numbers of sides, shall we say, I've tried, you know, hexagonal, I've had septagonal, I've tried, and that the one that seems to fit is absolutely um, a dodecagon, so a 12-sided figure. This, to me, looks like we're looking up, the, the light is above, and what we see, this sort of like a white column or white, let's say, stripe, that comes down to the bottom left corner. That is the interface between, on the inside of the dome, between two faces, between two of the twelve-sided figure. So with, with that, let's jump to my section, which is just below yours, and we have one uh, A, which is zero crater dome study, blah blah blah. And it's worth just just clicking on that and just zooming in a little. Um, there's an awful lot of lines there. I've coloured them as light blue. These are the same ones which we showed at last week's show and what I really my objective here was to find what geometry could potentially fit uh, looking at the features looking at the um, the section through the uh, the terrain I mean to me what I see is there are there is a moat or we talked about last week uh, a moat or a, um, a canal or ditch that runs around the perimeter. Yes, that could also be the upper edge of a crater. It could have been adapted. It could have been modified. It could have been created from zero. But again, let's get into the how these things were built later in the conversation. But then coming inward from the outside of the clock face coming towards the center, doesn't really matter, but the, the bottom left tends to show it off better than the, uh, the top right. You can see that there is like, um, after the ditch or moat, there is like another uh, plane and then we come into my second concentric ring um, and you can see there's like a lot of shadowing so that to me tells me that that is actually doming upwards it's actually a hill it is, it is a higher feature than the plains uh, further out from the center and as we move towards the center of the, the geometry we get to the top of the the, the, um, the top of the hill the top of the plateau and that when you zoom out, to me, it tells me that what we're seeing is the remains potentially of part of the roof, which could have collapsed. Now, I know that we're seeing, still seeing some in the sky in these photographs, um, but I think also that the bottom left looks like it's something could have collapsed on the ground and, and the material itself could have created the mound. Um, I get, these are all ideas that I'm just putting on the table. I'm, mm -hmm. This is a brainstorming conversation. Um, and again, I don't want to go into repeating everything we talked about last week, but for example... Well, we do if, have new people falling in and out all the time, so it's not really redundant for, you know... Mm. But we do have archives, Richard, and I do have new images I'd like to talk about okay. as well. I'd like to break some new ground as well. As good, just, good. You know. So what we can see is there are... In, in, in plan view, I can see that there are 12... You can see there are 12 circular... Uh, supports or columns, not the inner circle, it's, it's the sort of middle circle. And of those 12, I would say that there are witness marks on the ground which match up with probably seven or maybe eight of them. God. And that to me, After all that this to time. me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, let's just remember that one pixel is 82 meters, which is 270 feet. So, we also are not 100% sure if this photograph has been taken directly above and if the pixels are exactly square, if there's any perspective or foreshortening involved, there could be parallax, there could be lighting tricks and so on as well. So we don't know we have a perfect um, you know, bird's eye view of this, this crater, but I think it is pretty good, it's pretty clean. But I think it's remarkable that we have eight, seven to eight features on the ground that match up with uh, my supposed geometry. 
proposed geometry, mm -hmm. if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, Timothy, I think you nailed it. With number I two did. E. Well, two e. if that, to, yeah, go down to your picture number uh, two E. I just need to go back. I'm using this god awful Google. It's one of the lenses. It's the second one of the lens pictures. People will see it. Yes, number two B. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, two just turn four. that. Everybody, just just turn that sideways, and you're looking at the dome. I think that I think that's as close as we're going to come to its uh, original construction. You know, the bracing and stuff could add to that, whatever mm -hmm. was there. But it's that. Uh, sort of, um, uh, well, it's not faceting. But, well, you know, the, well, remember, these... I didn't put it because I wanted to spare Contia, but there's this beautiful panorama, the synthesis of the Lander camera and the so-called GoPro color, which freezes a beautiful 180-degree pan by this Czechoslovakian amateur uh, who posted it, which you can literally see the concentric rings of the glass of the remaining dome stretching out in front of you, below you, on that panorama. It's from a couple, three weeks ago. Just, you know, folks, go find it. That's the advantage of being in Club 19.5. You'll have a reference. But, yeah, uh, Tim, I, I think Ron is right. I think you're very, very close. Well, thank you very much, both of you. I mean, I, I believe there's a lot more to do still. Um, and... You know, again, again, I don't want to repeat everything, but if we can just revisit very quickly, 1C, you can see it's just basically my virtual, um, I call it my virtual shipyard. That's where I, I, I do my 3D design work. Um, and then also in 1D, you can see this is it's like a, a basic proposal of how the dome could have been. And at this stage, I've made it a circular feature. And at this stage, I have made it a smooth domed shape uh, the canopy above as a smooth dome shape which again as i mentioned last week is uh, an inverted catenary arch shape so it, it's it's very strong yeah. and it, it's it's already fallen if you like it, it's in its in its strongest configuration but what i want to move on to this evening especially is the my next section which is 2a and my section of two. And there, this is something which, Richard, you gave me the, the pointer for this, and that is the influences of the Fresnel lenses. Mm. And what we can see on the, the 2A figure is like a, I've, I've taken these from the internet. I can't remember the source, but thanks very much anyway. Um, <laughs> on the left, you can see there's a, a blue uh, dome shape, and also there is the Fresnel lens section below it. And what we're talking about purely here in light, in terms of light, is that the Fresnel lens can basically do the same job as the dome lens. And I know that light is not what we're talking here. We're talking geometry, we're talking structure. But I think it's very interesting that when you look at the Fresnel lens, it is also a, uh, like a, a sim has a similar feature to it, like for example, a corrugated um, a corrugated panel and that corrugated panel can be very strong and light and I think this is a very interesting direction to, to pursue You mean like you have a fluorescent light in the ceiling and then you put a plastic corrugated panel under it and it focuses and concentrates the light right where you want it That's the light side of the conversation but what I'm talking about is, is now structure so for example if you take a, a flat roof which is a very thin panel, it would start to sag, wouldn't it, between the beams. Right. But if you have a corrugated panel that sits above the same beams on the roof, then the corrugations give rigidity and stiffness. Ah. So I So think you get two for the price of one. You get structure and you get control of light. Exactly. Exactly. Now, I, I, again, the, if we go down to B, it's interesting. There's uh, just the theory of... Um, a basic ray diagram of a light source and the Fresnel lens. And then to see, you can see there's a glass Fresnel lens. People may have seen that as a skylight or even a headlight on a car. Let's face it, there are sort of similar optics going on there. 2D, I'm rushing through these because I want to get down to the bottom. 2D is actually the lens which is used on lighthouses. 
And this is a beautiful piece of kit. I'd love to have one if I ever find mm. one. But um, if you look closely, there are lots of rings of glass. And those, this, the profile that those rings of glass create when seen in section uh, create a dome. But the dome obviously has a focusing effect because this is optically engineered to, to, to sc ah, scan. Ruffles have ridges. Yes. So the ridges are interesting. And then 2E, this is a beautiful photograph. This is actually a similar object. And if you zoom in on that, you can see... These the were 19th this. century works of art when nothing for navigation in the Coast and Geodetic Survey except lighthouses kept ships and commerce going in the fledgling United States, prescinding obviously from Europe. But these were incredible engineering works of art. Absolutely. And, you know, this, this to me is... is Obviously, it, it completely conforms to our, our laws of physics, but on the other hand, it is of a different time and a different mentality, I believe. Mm. You know, we're, we're so deeply into the electronic age, but this is a physical age where, you know, people were actually cutting glass and, and creating angles and, and making physical machines that would, uh, you know, what can I say, shine the light into the great distance, whereas today somebody, I'm sure, would come up with some other thing which would be electronic-based. Um, so I like, I like this, this almost Jules Verne sort of I feeling was thinking, about this. I was thinking of, of the time machine. Remember the incredible yes. chariot that uh, uh, George Powell created for uh, the actor who played the, you know, H.G. Wells in that spinning disc of glass? Yes, I do, absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. So, 1870s. At this that was the that came out of the 1870s. Same period of time as all the steampunk stuff. Yep. 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 So, just to park this for a second, because I'd like to, to segue slightly. What we're looking at here, I'm I'm trying to find now the. I think I found the geometry for the for the for the dome in, in Jezero Crater. It's a 12-sided figure. I. Now ask myself, if you're going to create a large structure, and I, I need to just keep an open mind because this is huge, it's enormous. But the point is, if you're going to create panels, ceiling panels, roof panels, uh, columns, you know, whatever it is, I know from my, my, my yacht building experience that if you make everything curved, it takes a lot more time and it's a lot more expensive. And that's the, our perception on Earth. If you think of about a yacht, most you know, beautiful sailboat, most lines, if not all lines, are curved. Even the lines that look straight, their intersections are curved because you have camber, you have shear, you have um, you know, tumble home, you have all these different features that make up the beauty of this slippery, shiny, curved vessel of the hull I'm talking about mainly. So the craftsmanship and the close fitting comes from careful attention. Now, if you're going to have to do that on a gigantic scale, you know, I, I do question what is the manufacturing process? <laughs> uh, it, on Mars, would it also be easier to create flat, straight material, building blocks, let's say, or do we not care? Can we, can we somehow manifest panels, shapes, can we 3D print them? Um, you know, I'm just, just, just again, throwing it out there. Well, can we build them in a vacuum, atom by atom, with nanotechnology? Or even make the nanobots building blocks themselves, so they just go and park themselves next mm -hmm. to their friend, and then that's it. Mm -hmm. Possibly. Possibly. Now that, well, that Tim, be... if we go to your number three, I think I can visualize that sitting flat. You know, if okay. that was the framework for a dome, just picture it flat. Now you reach down, you pick it up from the uh, middle, and you just pull it up. You f unfold it like a Japanese lantern, oh, and yes. that's your structure. And I, uh, from a construction standpoint, everything could be done at ground level. Then you raise it up, and then you construct the dome over it. Okay, so this this is, again, last, last week I was talking in the most simplest, I said I took the most obvious and easy uh, geometrical form. Now this week, I am, I've been exploring something which for us is far more 
it's actually a very simple it's a simple uh, form to create once you do the legwork and you set up the geometry accordingly. All these are as a series of um, data points, which when you thread a, uh, a curve or a line through it, um, and then you extrude um, or sweep, you know, a, 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 let's say a circular section like I have in this particular case, it creates a, a geometrical and regular spiral. And these set of rings and their relationship to each other, each ring is, is continuous, it never ends. And each ring, um, I think, is also makes a very beautiful shape. It's, it's, it's a toroid, toroidal shape. And Richard, I think what could be interesting about this is that from the research I've done previously on toroidal shapes, is that this could potentially uh, either be used as a transmitter or a receiver <laughs> for energy. You're reading my mind. It's it's torsion physics that you live in. Exactly. Why not? Why not? Well, the Egyptians did it with clunky pyramids. This is so elegant. This is so exquisitely elegant. And it matches what we're seeing, which is elegance in ruin after however many hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of years. So... Well, thank you. And I, I, I love the shape. It's something I keep looking at, and it's something I'd, I'd like to make. I have no idea what I would make it into. Maybe a fruit bowl or <laughs> whatever it is. But, but I would like to. I'd like to have it created here. I'd like to have it as, as an object. I think. I like the shadows that come off. That's why I showed on the the side, the top view, and, and the perspective view. I, I left the the shadows on. I mean, I know it's a little bit complicated because, again, I'm not going to color the material yet. But the shadows, I think, are beautiful, and it's the way like, that the light it's, like, it's almost like two interwoven slinkies that, as Ron said, you just lift up into the third dimension, and bingo, there you have your substrate for your dome. Well, yes, and the thing is that if there was a way mm -hmm. of locking it off when it's up, then it could potentially support itself. Which I think is very interesting. So it is actually like a monocoque. Because the forces state. go round and round yeah. and round and come out here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, just articulated it. Just take one long straight piece of uh, material. You just add it. You build it by using reasonably sized sections uh, that you know articulate a little bit and um, try it like you would. That it would snap into position when it was all pulled up they would all lock snap into a lock position that's, that's fairly simple engineering I, I you can be the foreman okay Ron I love that you could ask me the foreman <laughs> guys just snap it into oh. place it's just simple engineering you know okay, <laughs> why does it well why? yeah that's good that's, yeah, yeah, that's good but, boss but, behavior but, but, I don't care get it done but Ron 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 <laughs> this gets back to our community yeah. where do you stand pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Well, you need a little helicopter. That's what they're, they're practicing with. Very uh, funny. Engineering. Yeah. Well, I assume they had some way to lift it. Well, you could lift it from the ground. Just crank it up. You know, just to, just you got a post, an extendable post, and you just, you just crank away on it. Okay, but I mean, my, my point, Ron, is how far... How, how far do we inhibit ourselves by, you know, Jasumian physics? Because if this is a torsion, toroid, toroidal torsion physics, you know, yeah. uh, spiral cage, then why does it not lift itself up? Why well, does remember, it not we, we have control of gravity. Look at Lee Scalman, what he did with Coral yeah. Castle. So yeah, these guys had control of the physics, control of gravity, control of life itself. And they were artists in elegance with the universe. I mean, this is not trivial, Tim. Not trivial at all. And guys, we have, we're about to spiral out into a break. I was just going to say, there's a break coming up. My guests this morning are nautical engineers and generalists and artists and um, arcology experts. I'm talking about Bob Harrison. As well as fine artists and electronic engineers and a cast of thousands. If you're approaching a generalist problem, you have to assemble a team of generalists 
to solve the problem. You're on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard C. Hoagland. We shall return to Mars following these messages. The other side of midnight.com. Talk radio with pictures on demand. Liberate your hyperdimensional time scale and non linearly access over 400 hours of conversation at the cutting edge of science and thought. Join Club 19.5 to get access to exclusive content that fits your interests and time schedule. Filter episodes by guest or subject. Membership costs $9.95 a month, 33 cents a day. Talk radio with pictures on demand. The other side of midnight.com. back everyone to the last half hour of the other side of midnight for this Saturday night Sunday morning edition we're talking about how do you build a 30 mile wide dome on the planet Mars not only with available technology but with a technology which is just slightly beyond what uh, is being publicly admitted I mean if you're a student of any of the Black Ops programs or the work of people like uh, Dr. Paul LaViolette or other colleagues around the world, you know that all these secrets of torsion field physics, unlimited energy, control of gravity, construction of spacecraft miles wide, it's all, it's all out there. It's all really real. It's real science, real engineering. We're just not supposed to know like so many other things we're not supposed to know, like our relationship to Mars. So back to our designer, Tim, uh, where you want to take us next? Well, I'm, I'm still enjoying this, the shape of this, this structure. I mean, I, I think that if we look at the, you know, past the architecture, what do people need when they live inside or around a piece of architecture they need you know the infrastructure they need heating or cooling they need air possibly or air, air cleaning i mean that, that's basic ventilation should we say let's not even go into the atmosphere right now but even in a public building like a cinema you need so many air changes per minute otherwise people you know it, 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 it smells of popcorn and uh, people sort of grow faint because the oxygen is used up so even on earth we clean the air so we need ventilation now, what I'm thinking is that if, again, if we go in to propose a structure of this type, then presumably this, this structural spiral, never-ending spiral, could provide the infrastructure for everything. So we have, you know, if we're thinking in, in sort of earthly ways, we have electrics, we have plumbing, we have ventilation ducts, we have, you know, these things could be easily large enough to even possibly put a... Uh, dare I say it, a monorail in it, you know, I mean, how far do we want to go with this? How, how, how blue is the sky above? So I'm, I'm at the point now where I'm brainstorming um, each week a different approach just to sort of say, how would I solve it this way? And part of it is intuitive, part of it is curiosity, and part of it is you know, feet on the ground 
is this going to work? Is this going to uh, find uh, create a solution for what we're trying to do here? Um, so I would like to propose I, I, I make another study for another future show. I have another. I have many ideas actually, but I have one specific idea in, in, in mind. And you know, I'm also very keen to involve you guys to, as I said from the beginning, is to involve you and to hear your ideas and to include your ideas. And I, I'm. If you say, I think that that's not going to work, it's not going to fly, or did you think of this, or, you know, uh, and also from our listeners, if our listeners wish to, you know, have a brainwave of an idea, why not message us and let us know and say, what about like this? And I'm not saying I can create models for everything that everybody likes them to do, but, you know, we're at a, a significant point, milestone in history, where it would be really, really wonderful if we could solve this and actually move forward um join the dots until we actually have feet on the ground and real photographs and you know independent photographs what i mean is of course real photographs independent photographs taken from from mars well tim on right on cue uh, a listener who's listening right in the moment uh if i may read this on air richard yeah by all means image 12 zoom in see a shadow line from top of mountain down this could be a ring shadow timothy was speaking about hope you get this during the show aj hmm um i think yes yeah i think aj ron and i've discussed this at length i think that that little conical thingy is actually a mini arcology there's a collapsed side which is on the side facing us uh i have a uh a, a rendition where I've been able to bring out the structural detail of the collapse so you can see the cubical architecture inside. So it's not a mountain, it's not a cinder cone. And that crack, I don't think is a shadow of the dome. I think it's the actual physical crack in the structure which is falling apart. And mountains don't fall apart because they're solid, but if you have something which is hollow and has numerous little cubicles inside, and you get a, a um, uh, uh, what would I call that, a, well, a, a, a tear going, like, you know, metal fatigue, where you get wings that come off airplanes because, you know, the metal literally breaks apart like a, like a tear in a fabric. I think mm -hmm. that's what we're seeing. I don't think, although it was a very good proposition, again, the test is we've seen this other places with things at, at the Curiosity site, Gale Crater, where one half of the structure has literally slid and is gone like you've taken a knife and cut it there's one particular structure ron you know the one i mean right yes so i think that's what we're seeing but it's a good try and keep at it because the more ideas the better and it's very easy to contact the show in the upper left hand corner there's a contact us and i don't know where it is on smartphones but it's it's present it says clearly contact us send us your ideas let me venture an idea that i was kind of proposing in a weird way that doesn't i guess communicate before if you look at number 11 okay tim mm -hmm. look at my number 11 blow it up so it's full screen yes you see that series of concentric ovals forget the detail yes. forget the because that's that's uh, what holger was talking about the light levels in the camera are digitizing, so you get steps. Mm -hmm. But look at the general luminosity. I think that is scattering in the dome, seen from inside, which if we could find a program to reconstruct a scattering translucent medium, that is telling us about the overall structure of the dome itself. In other words, form follows function, light scattering follows construction topology. I understand what you're saying, Richard, but from my point of view, and I can only offer you my, my, my opinion about this, the shape of the structure also defines the scatter. So That's what I'm saying. Yeah, but you're saying the other way around. I'm, 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 I'm no, I'm saying we can, we, we can back engineer the structure from the scatter. Okay, well, I don't know what software hmm. could analyze this and define the uh, the structure from it. My, 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 my idea is to create a model 
with a known structure made from the other points, the, the other dots that I'm connecting. Right. And then, then to go inside and give a certain refractive index to the material of the canopy and to render it and to match that to see if we're getting similar effects. We're, to... we're, we're talking the same thing. We're, we're actually just talking past each other, which I tend to do a lot these days. <clears throat> so never mind. <laughs> okay. So... <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, we are we are saying exactly the same thing. I just don't know whether Da Vinci is sophisticated enough because in addition to refraction, remember, you wouldn't be seeing that glow unless there was scattering, which means the glass okay. has to have fractures and there have to be scatters. Go ahead. Da Vinci is a, you know, a video, video edit suite and also it has lots of goodies packed into it. What I, I'm using is a three-dimensional modeling software ah, okay. package and then I'm using a rendering package and the rendering package I can very accurately uh, give materials and with different refractive index and color, any color. So at the point when I believe the architecture is in place you know, with these different studies, then absolutely, we can go inside. We can set a lens. We can give a refractive index. We can give a material to the material uh, to the structure of what we think the canopy is. But certain factors, like the thickness of the canopy and the shape of the canopy, mm. will will affect the scatter we're seeing. You know, if I make a, for example, I'm talking about the, the lighthouse photograph. You know, the photograph of that Fresnel lens, a beautiful thing. I, that's my next study, is to make a layer cake, like a, a, a 12 sided. Uh, Have you looked at that Czechoslovakian perch from seven miles up, 180 degrees in color of the dome above and below Percy? I have looked at it, yes. Okay, because that to me is showing us exactly what's there. Exactly. If I might. Uh... Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, if I might shamelessly redirect people to um, the uh, number eight in uh, my section, okay. the Ron section, well, that's, number that's eight. Tell everybody how and to get there. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Under the banner on the guest page, you click on uh, fast links to Ron's items. He's the last one after Bob, after Timothy, after me. Click on Ron. That yeah. will take you directly to his page. And oh my God, look at that. Holy yeah, well, look at how. Look at number eight first. It's a um, uh, that's a picture from Holden Crater. It's a reconnaissance orbiter, and that looks like structural materials made out of glass or something else lying around. That's mid latitude, so it's not. This is not ice formations. And there's another little kick on that. The um, you'll notice there's some rather saturated colors, mostly red in certain spots. And then you look over on the left and there's that dark depression there next to one of the piles of glass. And there's a rainbow in there. The, the light is being refracted. Uh, and that's what the blow up is below. And you can see there's a lot of texture to whatever is in that dark area. And that's where it's picking up the colors, but it's picking them up from that bright yellowish spot um, just to the right of center. Are you and, saying number um, eight? Yeah, because it's, it's not. It should be. A, it's not clickable on mine. I don't know why. Nope. Uh, ES, ESP zero six eight four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is not clickable. Fifteen thirty. There's, there's a no, bug. That's what I was. There's a bug in the program. Uh oh. Yeah, that's Rod, what I was afraid of. Rod, yeah, Rod. Sorry, yes? I made a mistake. I didn't scroll down far enough. There are a few glitches here. Yeah. Okay. Well. Okay. Well, we'll talk. Well, we'll carry it over to some other thing. But it's because uh, it has relevance to what you were just talking about. And I thought, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I was afraid of that. Uh, the um, well, I don't know if any of them are coming up then, because uh, some of them don't. I know the first one shows, but that is another subject entirely. That was from something Richard and I were talking about yesterday. <clears throat> Uh, oh that's yeah, a let, look. let us let us talk about that, okay? Because this is now a close-up of what I call the Kodiak Temple, and this is yes. from I think uh, Keith Laney's processing, right? No, no, mine. Oh, it's yours. It's okay. mine. Okay. No, this is this is from one of my yeah. This is from this is uh, from we Saul all did, Ford. We all look pretty similar. Okay. Yeah. No, they don't and look similar. There are differences. Depending upon okay. three is real, four is you know. The, they only obscured what they could recognize, and they didn't recognize much. So, no, this is very impressive. Right. 
Yeah, if anybody clicks on that and then looks at the uh, vertical section of the um, closest part of the Kodiak, what you may call it, uh, there's a face in there. You know, I'm, I'm weary about saying those. There are many. Yes, I know, but there's one very clear, big, full head looking yep. straight at us. Um, yeah, Andrew, uh, what we're talking uh, about is this This thing is a circular <clears throat> structure, an appendage to the east of the temple itself. When you look at the satellite imagery looking straight down. Right. And I noticed the other night that there appeared to be vertical panels depending upon how you adjust the resolution so you're not lost in the noise. It's the what I call the Gigi effect. Have I been standing up too close or back too far? Right. And if you're at the right distance, you can see this thing I think was covered with huge vertical panels of artwork and there's myriad faces and yeah. other representations on this structure. It was a temple to yeah, something. It's gorgeous. It, 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 it's very, uh, well, it reminds me of a lot of the Hindu stuff we see, the Hindu temples. But yes, it could be, yes, yes, yes. Uh, that too. Yeah. Anyway, uh, well, that wasn't the one that I wanted to throw into the conversation because, you know, we got to go with what's working. But um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, okay, we have a whole bunch of, of, of broken links there. I'm not quite sure what happened. So, Kinti, Richard, uh, uh, I, I believe Kinti has said the server crashed again. Oh, so, that's well, it wasn't her it wasn't her fault the i server, didn't think the it was server her. got over yeah the server got overwhelmed almost immediately richard i, I, I don't well, mean to but i don't mean to butt in but i know we're coming closely yet but bob wanted to review yeah. some of his material it's pretty amazing oh by so, all means robert go for it Hi. thank you andrew <laughs> bob so you gotta be more assertive you know you're in a whole bunch oh, of well, egomania the, the conversations like so quickly it's difficult to butt in <laughs> so uh, so, if you, yes, if listeners go to uh, the fast links and click on Bob, you get to Bob's items. So, it's about, this is an analysis that was inspired by those dark spots. Uh, so, uh, item one there is the image panel of the show two weeks ago. The yellow arrow showing those two dark spots you were talking about earlier in the show. Right. And another, uh, the image, in the same image, the picture below that, showing two dark spots, more clearly from something that uh, you uh, developed from uh, the pictures. So I decided, I was interested in those dark spots. Could they be something like meteorite damage in a, in a dome? Uh, so I went to the um, Mars Passive Perseverance website and looked for randomly picked an image that had a seemed to have a dark spot in it, which it can be seen at uh, in item two, and from that uh, image I developed mm. uh, the analysis in three and four. Uh, so four two is two is a raw frame from uh, we saw yeah. one the left mass cam. And so, so we're going to three, right? Three or four. Four is a smaller version of three, which might be more appropriate for people to come uh, and click again to enlarge it. So you can see that I've circled the darkest spot in this uh, launchy sky. Uh, and I could see, the, uh, to my eye, there seemed to be other spots, at least two. Do you remember me telling you what I think these are? Reflections. Reflections. Multiple reflections. Internal geometric reflections from the layering and the structure of the upper part of the apex of the dome. So, so the middle image, I just, I knew that is a, um, a standard um, contrast adjustment. That didn't improve things. You can see that the dark spot is now dark. <laughs> can I can I interrupt again with a very important observation? Do you see what's behind your dark spot? All over the frame? It looks, it looks like stars to Yes! But they're not. They're shards of glass. They're little prisms. Well, 
in the PNG, they are fairly prismatic. The PNG version yeah. of the picture. And I've got two yeah. more that I found that were taken the other day. So, so um, that didn't improve things in seeing the other dark spots I could see. Uh, so I sort of needed something that sort of macro-wise uh, leveled the contrast, but at, a, but at a local level increased it. Uh, so there's something called local equalization. Mm. So I applied that and that came up with the dark spots that I could make out uh, showed up very well. And there were lots of circular features, lots of them uh, very close together. It looks like you're looking at an infinite two mirrors. You know, you know the infinite mirror paradox? You stand between two mirrors and you see yourself in infinity. That's what it looks like. They're all the same size. I think they're all mirrors of either one or two of these things, whatever they are. I don't think they're holes in the dome. I think they're more structured. But they look like multiple, multiple reflections of the same couple, two or three objects. Yeah. So the speckling in No, 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 no. don't, don't, don't. Am, am I right, wrong, all wet, whatever? I do, well, possibly. I've, possibly. I've got a slightly okay. different idea. So okay, go ahead, go to, ahead. So anyway, the speckling in that picture is just Locally, equalization brings out noise as right, well. Right, of course. Uh, so, um, get out of that. Uh, number five is just an example of uh, a standard image of the face and a locally equalized version. If you click on that, you mm. the, uh, enlarge again. You can see that the, the facial features in this jump out at you more, even though the image itself But that showed, that's to show the local equalization. That's the power exist. of this technique. By the way, is that available in a commercial program? Uh, yes, it's, it's, it's standard in the antiquated program that I use. So it, it just shows it doesn't necessarily destroy data or right. add to it. And then number six, what I've done here is I've, I've smoothed over the image to get rid of the speckling, the noise, and I've applied this 3D of a texture effect to, it, to bring out all the circular objects. So lighter areas, sort of shadow, will be shaded to stand out, and darker areas will be. Sure, uh, looks like an infinite mirror to me. Yeah, it looks a bit like a moon landscape, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, if, if it was a 3D image. So, so number seven is an analogy of my other idea, which is this is a normal geodesic uh, dome which has panels, you know, it's just a thin skin. And your idea for a dome is that it's a thick dome. Uh, and so, if we think 3D, and my idea well, hang on, hang on. The reason I think it's thick at the top, Tim, pay attention, please, because for that checked image, you're suspended between dome above you and dome below you, and you're about six and a half miles. So I think the apex of this thing is about a mile thick. The top is seven, the bottom would be six, and so you got about a mile of structure at the apex, doing whatever it is doing optically. Yep. So, in seven, in an analogy, it was made out of two D panels. So, with a thick dome, rather than panels, I was thinking, if rather if these are reflections, then what you could actually be seeing would be three D bubbles that make up the uh, micro. The elements, the smaller elements of the dome. Mm. And it, yeah, so that's the idea. But anyway, it's very, it's very intriguing. You know, uh, See, I eventually know. we may know because if Tim is successful in his reconstruction, at some point, am I right, Tim? You'll be able to take a model, put
put light into it, look at it from various directions, and match it to the imagery, and we'll see what what works, right? Abs absolutely. I mean, the, I still have a 3D uh, scanned map from NASA um, of Curiosity. Uh, sorry, Gale Crater is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, it's a huge three-dimensional file, which is the terrain there, and I'm hoping maybe somebody will do one which is zero crater, and then I can actually put the actual terrain underneath the actual dome underneath. And I then think those are called place. DTMs, Digital Terrain Models, and there's a bunch mm. of amateurs uh, in a couple of the chats that I've been following that normally have leaks. Nothing like that has come out of this mission yet, and I'm very kind of curious as to why. It's like there's like an iron curtain. This mission is not leaking like Curiosity did. Absolutely fascinating. No, I'm, I'm looking forward at the moment. I'm absolutely exploring. I'm assembling the, the tools and also the, the building blocks. And when things start to become, you know, more than logical, then I intend to put them together and make uh, renderings with us in there, different viewpoints, different heights, different altitudes, and so on. Tim, you're a, yes. do you have access to a 3D printer? Uh, not currently, not unless I pay oh. somebody to use one. But um, Oh, yeah, you... well, I mean, there... Uh, no, I'm uh, I'm thinking that your stuff is well math based. You know, you could just feed that into a 3D printer and have it make a toroidal toroidal structured dome or a Fresnel structured dome. Either one. You know, you could make one. You mean an actual tabletop model, 3D model? Yes. Yeah. yeah ex exactly. All right, Bob. I didn't mean to cut you off. All right, but ideas tend to spill out when we see these synchronous things. So continue, please. Uh, yes, I've largely finished anyway, but, uh, so, yes, possibility, you know, I don't know, I don't know it's creating these spots, whether it's a dome, whether it's something to do with a camera, or <laughs> dust on the lens. No, 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 it's, no, but, no uh, it, it's not, we never but, know it's not. But the fact that it's there is, uh, you know, the, the this sort of, uh, visual structure of spots is there suggests that perhaps there's a real dome there. I'm not sh I'm not entirely sure why it's don't really see it from seen from orbit. It seems to be just like a, a two-way mirror. No, 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 uh, no, no, you do see it. Let's go back to Tim. Tim, let's go back to Tim's images, which means I have to click back here. Uh, click on Tim. There we are at the top. Look at number one. Bob, yep. this is a black and white <clears throat> of the color Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter imagery. The maps laid down by taking multiple color strips and putting them all together in a computer. And what Tim did was take, out, take away the color, make it black and white. And remember last week I was so excited because you're seeing what's left of the dome, which is exactly the way I reconstructed it. The western part has been eroded because of sand sandstorms from the southwest and it's being progressively eaten so a little less than half of it is still optically there and that's that whole white portion from the center to the edge on the right and that's, richard yeah richard our show is ebbing away you got about 60 seconds oh my 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 it's amazing how things fly when you're having fun i'm i'm glad someone is monitoring the time tonight well, guys, I guess we're going to do this all again next week because we'll have new models from Tim. We will have re results from... 90 seconds. Oh, thank you, dear. Thank you. I could not have done without that, okay? Um, and we'll have results from Ingenuity, and maybe we can talk next week about how do we figure out the density of the atmosphere that they're actually flying in, okay? Anybody have a punctuating last word here? We've got about uh, 70 seconds. Yeah, I do. Uh, there's a there's a monstrous phenomenon about to happen. These cicadas that come out every 17 years, these beautiful states, including Washington, D.C. And the reason why I bring it up is that it reminds me of the Ingenuity helicopter unfurling its wings oh, and then my. beginning a mating. Yep, it's amazing. Amazing. 
Well, everyone out there, tomorrow night we're going to be going from Jezero Crater on Mars to Giza, the Giza Plateau on Earth. And there may be surprises. So tune in. Until then, same time, same bat channel. Remember, third star on the left, straight on till morning. Good night, everyone, and keep looking up.